This evening, Books and Books, in collaboration with the Prologue Society, Miami Today, and Brickle Bank, is very happy to welcome Dr. Catherine Fletcher and her new book, The Black Prince of Florence, The Spectacular Life and Treacherous World of Alessandro de' Medici. Dr. Fletcher is a historian of Renaissance and early modern Europe. Her first book, The Divorce of Henry VIII, brought to life the papal court at the time of the Tudors. She consulted on the Golden Globe winning TV miniseries Wolf Hall and regularly broadcasts for BBC Radio. She's associate professor in history and heritage at Swansea University and has held research fellowships in London, Florence, and Rome. In this book, she brings us the story of Alessandro de' Medici, arguably the first person of color to serve as a head of state in the Western world. Born out of wedlock to a dark-skinned maid and Lorenzo de' Medici, he was the last legitimate heir to the line of Lorenzo the Magnificent and ruled Florence from 1531 to 1537. Here to share more of this fascinating tale with us, please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Catherine Fletcher. Well, thank you very much for having me, and it's a pleasure to be here with so many people interested in this particular piece of Italian Renaissance history. Alessandro de' Medici is an elusive man. We know that he ruled Florence 1531 to 1537. His regime, however, was controversial. Its legitimacy was questioned, and so was his personal legitimacy. Alessandro was born a bastard, said to be the son of a slave, and said to be of African descent. And tonight I want to share with you some of his story and try and answer a question that is very often put to me. Is it really possible that a young man with such a background could have become the ruler of an Italian city at this time, almost 500 years ago? But I want to start not uh, in Florence, in fact, but here in the United States of America in 1931. Because although um, this story has not had the attention it deserves, I think, it has certainly been written about to a limited extent before. And one of the people who wrote about Alessandro was Arturo Schomburg, who you may know um, as the, the great collector of materials for African and African-American history, who is now um, has given his name to a center at the New York Public Library. An amusing, sorry, that was, um, which is right, that's um, Schomburg there. And then on the next slide, we have the little portrait of Alessandro that he wrote about. And um, he said of Alessandro's case, I think if this had happened in North America, the picture would have been removed long ago and by some plausible excuse, relegated to the cellar or entirely discarded. But the Florentines lived up to the judgment of history. The truth cannot be always concealed from the eyes of the world. So here is the unvarnished story of the picture. A young man of Negro descent was married to the daughter of the Emperor of Germany, King of Spain and King of Naples, and he became the first Duke of Florence. Now, this story, um, continue to circulate. It was published um, by Joel Rogers in the 1940s and that article um, from 31 got a reprint in the 1960s. So what do we know of the real Alessandro? We have a number of portraits which you'll see over the course of the evening which tend, um, some more than others, to point to his being a man of African descent. We also have textual sources that tell us something about his ethnicity and background. For example, the rumor that his mother was a slave circulated within his lifetime. So we can concretely say that is something that contemporaries said about him. Now, whether or not it was true or exactly true, or whether they looked at him and he said he looks like the sort of person whose mother may have been a slave, that's another question. Within living memory of Alessandro's rule in the 1560s, there's a more specific story about the background of his mother 
She is described in a French book um, on the illustrious men of the House of Medici as demi negra, which literally translates as half negro. The identity of Alessandro's mother, though, is difficult to be absolutely sure about. I just um, show you this picture. This is not for certain Alessandro's mother, but it's a woman um, holding the hand of a dark-skinned child in a portrait showing many members of the Medici family um, in 1515, when Alessandro would have been about three years old. So you, it may allude um, to her and him. What we do know more certainly, though, is that she was a woman of low rank, and that almost certainly she worked in the Medici household, the household of Alessandro's grandmother, Alfonsina Orsini de' Medici, um, a bride of a Medici man who was originally from Naples. The Naples connection is important because Naples had a substantial um, population of enslaved black Africans at this time, more so than many other Italian cities. And what appears to have happened is an all too typical story in aristocratic households of the period, in that Alfonsina's son, Lorenzo, who is the um, man in the rather lavish dress in a Raphael portrait on the left there, um, he decided to take advantage of the household staff and got this woman, who may be called Simonetta, pregnant. Now, at the time of his birth, as far as we can tell, Alessandro was not acknowledged by the Medici family. Um, it took several twists of fate before they even began to pay attention to him. Let me just read you a little bit from chapter one of the book, which explains the first of three, these three turns of fortune. It was February 1518, and Lorenzo de' Medici, Duke of Urbino, and de facto ruler of Florence, had another boil on his leg. It caused him some discomfort, but not enough to prevent his travel to France a few months later for his wedding. Lorenzo, the last legitimate heir in the main line of the Medici family, was to marry Madeleine de la Tour de Verne, an heiress and a distant relative of French royalty. Within a couple of months, Madeleine was pregnant. She made her entry to Florence on the 7th of September. May God grant long life to the Duke and to her, wrote Lorenzo's secretary, and many children. But neither long life nor many children were to be. Lorenzo's health deteriorated over the coming months, while after giving birth to a daughter, Catherine, the Duchess contracted a fever and died shortly after childbirth. The news did little for the Duke's health. Every hour his condition seems more serious and more dangerous, wrote his secretary. On the 4th of May, Lorenzo died of syphilis. He was 26. And with Madeline's child a girl and Lorenzo gone, the Medici had no legitimate male heir. The dynasty's future lay with two small boys, eight-year-old Ippolito, illegitimate son of a noblewoman, and his seven-year-old cousin, Alessandro, dark-skinned and said to be the illegitimate son of a slave. As one historian has put it, the gods were briefly standing up for bastards. So uh, what we have is, as you can see um, in the image here, um, the two, we have the remaining members of the Medici family. Lorenzo on the left has gone. We have Pope Leo X, um, who is the guy in the middle of the center portrait. And to his left, Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who will also come in at a later stage as Pope. And then on the right of that slide there, you see at the top, Ippolito de' Medici, the elder cousin, and below him, Alessandro. So these are the people in play. We also, of course, have the baby daughter. And she will grow up to be Catherine de' Medici, the Queen of France, and the most powerful woman in Europe. But because Florence was a society which had an all-male electorate and a limited franchise to select its rulers at this time, she was not a possibility to lead the city. It had to be one of the boys. 
So, after his father's death, Alessandro is, for the first time, acknowledged by the Medici. He starts to appear in the documents. The diplomats from Rome write back and say, ah, well, there are two little bastards, apparently. There's um, this one, Apollo, and then there's, a, there's another one, Alessandro. So they discover him. And he starts at that stage, from the age of about seven, to be given a refined education in the Medici household to prepare him to take some sort of role within the family's broad strategy for maintaining power, both in the city of Florence, their traditional hometown, but also in Rome. And one of the ideas is that Alessandro will become um, a churchman and his elder cousin, Ippolito, whose mother, unlike Alessandro's, is of genteel rank and who has always been acknowledged by the family, that Ippolito will take on the leadership of Florence. So, in 1524, when he is about 13, Ippolito makes his entry um, to the hometown. He arrived in Florence on a bay jennet, a small Spanish saddle horse. He was clad in black. His entourage of 10 grooms wore red silk and white leather corslets. That this could be described by a contemporary as without any ceremony indicates just how extravagant normal life could be. Ahead of their procession rode a ten-year-old black page on a dappled jennet. Black pages were rather fashionable among the nobility of Renaissance Italy. Although Europeans did not yet have a fully worked out theory of race, they stereotyped and objectified black Africans in various ways. These children, for example, were treated as exotic objects through whom a master or owner could demonstrate good taste and refinement. And for me, one of the interesting things about doing this research and going through the archive documents with paying attention to questions of race and ethnicity because of Alessandro's own case was the number of other people of color who I found in passing in situations like this um, particular black page, but also we find an African drummer um, in Florence, African dancers being solicited for the court of Rome. Um, there are a number of stories of escaped slaves that crop up. So one finds overall, not just um, in Alessandro's own person, a much more diverse society than we might, you know, 20 or 30 years ago have, have read about in the textbooks on Italian Renaissance history. So here we are in the 1520s with these two young men, Ippolito slated to rule Florence and Alessandro probably to go into the church. But there's another twist. Sorry, this is the this um, image that I'm showing you just here is the lovely villa outside Florence at Poggio a Caiano, where Alessandro lived while Ippolito um, made, his, made his base in the city. So the next twist comes in 1527. So the, the boys are about um, 15 and 16 by this point. And for the purposes, the, the political situation in Italy is rather complex. But what you need to know for the purpose of this argument is that it's divided up into um, lots of little competing states. And there is a war going on, has been for over 30 years, between the two great powers of Europe. France on the one hand, and the Holy Roman Empire, which combines Spain, Austria, the Netherlands, what is now Germany, um, led by the Holy Roman Emperor on the other. That's Charles V is the emperor. And in 1527, his troops, who have not been paid for some time, decide that they will go and sack Rome, and they take the Pope hostage. He is Clement VII, the Medici Pope and head of the Medici family. Long-standing enemies of the Medici up in Florence realize that this gives them an opportunity. Clement is effectively imprisoned and, uh, and unable to act. So they kick the Medici out of Florence, leaving them with no base there, exiled in effect to Rome, where the Catholic Church provides their center of power. 18 months later, they're still exiled from Florence they still have their only power base as the church. And Clement VII thinks he's dying. The one thing you can do if you are the Pope and you think you are dying and you want to maintain a hold on power for your family is you can make your eldest nephew a cardinal. 
and that is what he does. Um, you see um, in the slide there, Ippolito, the elder nephew, in his cardinal's robes. Now, Ippolito really does not like this because making him a cardinal means he's going to have to take holy orders. He therefore cannot contract a dynastic marriage and he cannot have heirs to follow him as ruler of Florence. And that is the third twist that brings Alessandro de' Medici here in a lovely um, propaganda portrait by Pontormo um, during his rule of the city into the limelight as the future ruler of Florence. Very quickly, a marriage is arranged for Alessandro to the daughter of Charles V. That's Charles V you see there on the right, and his daughter Margaret, who at the time of the betrothal is only six and a half years old. Um, typical that these aristocratic families um, betrothed their children um, very young for dynastic alliance re reasons, and then they have to maintain that betrothal over a long period. And Charles and his troops commit, as part of a whole um, package of, of, of a peace deal, in effect, a diplomatic alliance, to get the Medici back into power in Florence. So, Alessandro um, starts to cultivate the support of his future father-in-law. He attends Charles at his coronation. This is an image of some of his entourage um, there, the, the household of his ducal household. He also accompanies Charles on a progress through, um, through Germany up towards the Netherlands where he meets his future bride for the first time. And he really distinguishes himself um, in all the appropriate accomplishments for a young aristocratic man. Um, he's a great jouster. There is one tournament where he is said to completely outdo the Spanish, much to um, Italian pride. He breaks 14 lances. He... Um, has all those qualities of athleticism and, and so forth that we expect of a Renaissance prince in this period. And Charles does what is expected of him and his troops besiege Florence, throw out the old regime and bring Alessandro to power in 1531. Now, as you can imagine, anybody who comes into power in a city-state, having taken that power with the backing of foreign troops, is going to have some enemies. And Alessandro has many enemies. He has long-standing opponents of the Medici family, who his regime exiles from the city with some quite brutal manoeuvring. One or two of the most, well, certainly one of the most prominent opponents of the regime, Raffaello Girolami, dies in custody presumed poisoned. Um, Alessandro also has opposition within the family, particularly from Ippolito, who becomes more and more resentful of the fact that his younger and lower status cousin has ended up as ruler of the city which he wants to rule. He has an idea that he can do what a couple of decades earlier Cesare Borgia has done and quit being a cardinal in order to become a duke. Charles V, however, is having none of it. Um, Alessandro does a very impressive job of maintaining that alliance with the emperor throughout his rule. He goes on to build a very beautiful court, um, largely based here at the Palazzo Medici, you can, which you can still visit in Florence. It's the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, somewhat changed, but some parts of it quite similar to um, how they would have been in Alessandro's time. He starts to patronize artists and collect art. This is one um, piece that he owned, a Venus and Cupid by Pontormo to a design by Michelangelo. He rather fell out with, Alice, with Michelangelo, however. Michelangelo did not approve of the Medici ducal regime. And after completing the tombs for Alessandro's father and um, uncle, which are in the new sacristy in Florence, left town never to return or work for the Medici again. Alessandro collected guns. Um, this is a, a type of weapon he might have owned. Uh, guns were a new technology at the time. Uh, but he also, however, became rather unpopular for imposing strict controls of the carrying of weapons in the city, which certain um, citizens of Florence regarded as an unacceptable infringement of their liberties. And 
he held some wonderful parties. And one of my favorite bits of um, research in the archive was finding a list of costumes for a Turkish-themed masquerade, which appears to involve um, people from the court dressing up um, at possibly as the, the Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, who you see here, but certainly as his chief admiral, Barbarossa um, Karat Din, who um, various Christian alliances were um, fighting with in the Mediterranean over this period. All this court building um, seemed to go really rather well. And Alessandro does a marvelous job really of following much of the advice in Machiavelli's Prince, which is a text that rather haunts this story. Machiavelli had um, written it for patrons in the Medici family around the time that Alessandro was born. And although he died a few years before Alessandro came to power, you can see some of the advice being followed rather neatly. But in the end, and this is not a spoiler because I tell you this at the start of the book, Alessandro was assassinated. And I argue that he was assassinated twice. First, literally, with the sword. He was stabbed to death six times by a member of his inner circle and an accomplice. But then with the pen. Because the person who first told this story of Alessandro and why he had to go was his killer. The assassin wrote an apology, not really, not saying sorry I murdered you, but a justification in that, that classical sense of apology for the murder, in which he described how Alessandro was a tyrant who had behaved completely outrageously in government, who was worse than the evil Roman emperors Caligula and Nero, who was unfit to rule on account of his mother, who didn't even know who his, mo who his father was because his mother had had sexual relations with not only Duke Lorenzo, but also Cardinal Giulio and with her own husband. So he was possibly not even a member of the Medici family at all. And Alessandro's successor in power, Duke Cosimo de' Medici, was quite happy to let some of these rumors continue because it meant that he, Cosimo, could blame the worst excesses of the Medici regime on his bad guy predecessor and appear to be a new ruler coming in who was going to be much more conciliatory. And the stories of Alessandro as tyrant percol percolate through into popular culture, from Jacobean revenge drama in the 17th century to 19th century accounts where the republican-minded assassin fighting for liberty and killing the tyrant as he does it became a rather popular story for people in all sorts of European contexts to tell. Still to this day, Alessandro does not have his own monument in Florence. He is buried in his father's tomb um, here in the new sacristy in San Lorenzo. And you would only know that he was there if you could read the passing mention in a long Latin inscription that is on the wall. Otherwise, we just hear nothing about him. So it's my hope really that through writing this book and try to shed some new light on his life and to disentangle some of the stories that have been mixed together, including some of the very problematic 19th century histories that mingled the tales of Alessandro's tyranny with tales of his race, in a very um, racist way, to be honest, um, that if we can disentangle that and pin down what we do know about the facts of this case and what must remain myth and rumor and imagining, we can begin to understand um, this very exciting period of history a little better and we can get to know something of Alessandro himself. Thank you very much for listening and do say if you have questions. Yes. So, yes, Catherine went on to write. So ask you about the relationship between Alessandro and his half-sister Catherine. Now, Catherine went on to France when she was 14, um, in the middle of Alessandro's rule in Florence in 1533. She has some relations with him in the sense that, for example, when his fiancée first comes to visit him in Florence in that year, 1533, they hang out together. They are two teenage girls. They, um, I won't, won't imagine what they get up to, but we don't have a lot of detail. And later on, after Alessandro's death, 
Catherine proves very friendly to both his assassin, who is on the run, and to another member of the family, Piero Strozzi, who was also a strong opponent of Alessandro's rule. So one gets the, the, the idea that certainly, latterly, she was happily siding with his enemies. Whether she was doing that when she was 14 and going off to get married is less clear. Yes. He's the great grandson of the Magnificent. So you get Lorenzo the Magnificent, then Piero, then another Lorenzo, and then Alessandro. I've got fam there are family trees in the book. It's a very complex set of family relationships, but there's lots of guidance to help you navigate it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, what happens to the African population, Naples? Well, most of the African population, Naples, intermarried and became part of the Italian population. It was an, it was an issue, in fact, that taxed anthropologists in the 19th century who were working in a climate of intellectual sort of scientific racism because they were they were very worried about the fact that this over the years this African migration might have had a bad effect on the the Italian stock as it were and so they did lots of research which is in some ways is quite good research if you ignore all the the, the sort of racist overtones it has identifying numbers of Africans who came in to Italy in the 19th century I mean or who were around in the 19th century and over the extended period. So yes, they, they were there. And if you actually, if you do DNA testing on those populations now, you will get people coming up with significant um, degrees of African descent, even though they may not recognize that in themselves. Yes. Do we say, yes, so uh, I've been asked about um, prejudice against blacks. So in this period, there is certainly a degree of color prejudice. There is the idea that, um, for example, the proper skin color for a nobleman is pinkish white. Dark skin is associated with the lower classes, not least because people are working out of doors and are less able to protect their skin from the sun. But what you don't have at this stage is the kind of, you know, really sharp hierarchy of people classified into different races that comes in the later 16th and into the 17th century. That type of hierarchical classification starting to emerge around this time, but that is really a product of a European need to justify the enslavement of Africans and their transport here to the Americas. And in order to do that and to explain why they are treating Africans differently than they would treat other people, they have to have a theory of different races being, you know, the, the, of, of dividing up humanity in that way. At this point, the slave population in Italy is actually quite diverse. It includes people of a number of different ethnicities, and there isn't that kind of relationship between slavery and blackness that you see later on. So, you know, this all, it's also worth saying that somebody like Alessandro, who is perhaps one quarter African, if we believe that the French source would not necessarily have been perceived as black in the way that somebody today with one African grandparent might well be perceived as black because, I mean, for example, in this country you have the, the, the legacy of things like the one drop rule where just having one um, ancestor even quite far up the family tree who was classified as black would mean that you also fell into that classification. So none of that stuff is around in this society. We need to be quite careful not to read back assumptions today about who is categorized as black into you know, what, what was going on 500 years ago.
Yes, and I think that I think I mean you're you're quite a lot further on historically by that point because you, and you're into the later if I if I remember the dates rightly the later 18th and early 19th centuries, um, and at, by that point you were starting to get quite explicit. I mean you started to get abolitionist ideas. You start to get the ideas of um, equality of all humanity. Nobody in the 16th century thinks that all human beings are equal, really at all. It's just they don't classify them by race. So later on, you get it, it's a it's a complex story. But that case that you're talking about is quite a bit further on historically. A lot of things have happened between Alessandra's time and the time of the Black Count that um, influence what's going on. We had a question over here. Yes, Alessandro has descendants. In fact, there is one line of the of his family. He has two illegitimate children, um, and one line of that family comes right down to the present day. Um, so, yes, they are there. His daughter Julia, who is actually featured in a portrait that's in the um, in the Walters in Baltimore, in a double portrait, she um, she has she marries, has children, and they continue down. And in fact, if you look at um, Julia's portrait, again, she looks conceivably like a woman, woman of African descent. Yes. Yes, well, the, the, the descendants, I mean, uh, there is a real question about the viability of DNA testing of descendants quite so far down. I mean, I know from following the, the, the discussion around um, Richard III in, in the UK, um, King Richard III's body was re recently discovered that this is not a straightforward process, um, nor is it a straightforward process with DNA from around the Mediterranean basin, where you have a very, very long history of all sorts of populations mixing over centuries, and therefore, finding uh, a you know any ethnically pure population from the 16th century to compare against is quite unlikely to happen. So it's difficult. But you know, Alessandro's body is there in the tomb, and some members of the Medici family who are in a different set of tombs have had scientific analysis done on their skeletons, um, just not this particular group. So it's possible that at some point there will be some research that might allow us to say something more about it. But the, um, exactly what you can say reliably with DNA on bones of that age, when you can't necessarily, you don't necessarily have a straight line up the maternal side, it's, yeah, it's a challenging thing to do. The, D the DNA in Italy, yes, the DNA in Italy is very mixed and has been and and has been well since since the ancient Roman Empire. You know there are there are migrants from Africa. The Roman Empire stretched well into Africa, so you've had yes, yes, yes. There are blonde, blue-eyed slaves. In fact, the Medici. I mean, what there is an illegitimate member of the Medici family a few generations before Alessandro, who is also the son of a slave. But his mother is from Circassia, which is now part of Russia. So they are Slavs, and that is indeed where it comes from. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so we're being asked about legitimacy and illegitimacy in, in Florence and what, what were the rules. In Renaissance Italy generally, it was not uncommon to legitimize bastard children. There is a process for doing this. It is quite, it, it, it happens, particularly in circumstances where you are short of legitimate sons, that you incorporate them into the family in ways that, do, that, that um, are different from what happens in other European countries, where this is much less common. So there's a process and it is used, but it's only used in somebody like Alessandro's case, it's used as a last resort when they really need him. Whereas in his cousin Ippolito's case, 
clearly he is um, the son of a, of a woman of, um, you know, the upper middle class. He is considered, she is considered respectful and he is not legitimized, but acknowledged by the family early on and then legitimized when they need him to start playing a part. So they, they are still considered um, second class to um, fully legitimate children born in wedlock, but they are not entirely unacceptable as heirs in the way that they are in, in some other parts of Europe. Thank you. All right, folks, so if there are no more questions, then a reminder to our internet audience watching at home that there's still plenty of time for you to call the number on your screen and you can get the Black Prince of Florence uh, mailed to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. For those of you here in the house, we have the book for sale at the counter in the front room over there. Uh, Dr. Fletcher will be signing over there at the table to the left of the screen. And this has been really fascinating. Please give another hand to Dr. Catherine Fletcher. Thank you.